Hi everyone, I'm Sonia Trivedi, Communications Manager at Moodle, and today we are at Moodle Mood Global 2023. I have a really interesting guest with me, James Wiley, who is VP Product and Research at List EdTech. This is a market research firm that tracks systems used in education. Hi, James. How are you doing today? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for joining. And I know you're joining from the US, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. Flew here uh, on Monday. Perfect. Yeah. And it is your first Moodle Mood, right? My very first. And I'm already impressed. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Today you had a talk on artificial intelligence in education and the workplace. What now? What next? And I'm curious to know a little bit more about it. Starting with my first question, AI has been in education for 10 years. That's what I minutes. understood yes. from your presentation. So why do you think the topic of AI exploded now? Like, walk us through that. Yeah, I think a couple of things. I think one is the anxiety around a artificial intelligence globally when it comes to bias and misinformation. Mis 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 the EU is doing a great job. The US is not. But you have groups that, as a as nation, are trying to focus attention on whether we should have guardrails or some sort of ethical set of standards. That coupled with the explosion of ChatGPT that happened at the end of last year, I think is bringing artificial intelligence to the, um, to the minds of everyone around the world, and now we're focused on that. So the two things together, one, the kind of longer global move to put ethical um, safeguards around artificial intelligence, and then the introduction of ChatGPT in November of last year. Right, okay. And you mentioned a little bit more about the current state of AI in education. Yes. Can you tell us about it? Sure, largely there are pretty much five big areas that's being used and it's kind of, uh, they are retention, our students dropping out, um, ad admissions, which students are the right fit, um, advising, how do I support students, uh, teaching and learning, that kind of information. Um, and then there are some things like, like proctoring and things like that that's being used right now. All of those are primarily machine learning, which are just algorithms that help us predict. That's what they're doing. They don't involve ChatGPT or anything like that right mm -hmm. now. Um, but I know teaching and learning is one where ChatGPT is becoming uh, more and more prevalent, at least over the past few months, where technologists are thinking, how, how do I help course content development? How do I do this by using generative AI or ChatGPT? Right. If you have to choose, according to you, which are the biggest use cases from those? Uh, the biggest use case in order, the biggest one right now is probably admissions, <laughs> right. actually identifying the right students. Um, because, you know, institutions around the world, particularly in the U.S., but around the world are struggling to meet enrollment goals because students were away for a long time, right? They were away for COVID. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the revenue that students had coming in was lost because they weren't there. Um, so they're now ramping up their efforts around targeting the right students. I mean, targeting in a good way. Um, I think retention would be next. Um, uh, next in terms of popularity, making sure I find the kids who are at risk of dropping out. And how do I do that? Those are the two big ones of the five. Interesting, interesting. Okay, and as you pointed out, ChatGPT has been a big topic nowadays, mm -hmm. yes. right? How do you think technologies such as generative AI, especially ChatGPT and similar tools, will impact education in the workplace? I think it's going to impact hugely. Um, yeah. But I think one caution for a lot of the technologists in the space is to make sure that we're focusing on ChatGPT, generative AI, as supplementing and not supplanting yeah. um, the effort. So it, we have to think about it as adding to the value of instruction, not replacing instructors, right? So instructors, if you take off of their plates the idea of, well, writing course content and doing this stuff, you take that off, they can focus on being more creative with their students, encouraging critical thinking, encouraging innovation of thought, encouraging those things. Because ChatGPT can't do those. Um, so I think it's going to impact in terms of taking a lot of the more manual tasks off the plate of instructors and, and, uh, and in the workplace, like others, HR, um, human resource people, et cetera, is going to take that yeah. off the plate and should therefore free them up to uh, attack the more higher level skills 
and that's what I'm hoping will happen. Um, but I think there's still a lot of anxiety around it, where whether people are, their jobs are at jeopardy, because if we see from everything else, we're worried about robotics taking our jobs, we're worried about yeah. other things taking our jobs. In this case, I don't think it's true, um, but I appreciate the anxiety. Right. <laughs> I heard that Harvard launched the first robotic uh, professor. That's right. Something. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so quite a lot of work has been in, done That's in right. this area. And there's a lot of terror. I mean, you know, ChatGPT is already doing very well in medical school exams and law school exams yeah. <laughs> just on its own. I don't want um, ChatGPT to be my doctor, um, yeah. but it can be used. There was an interesting study just recently in the UK. It's used for mental health. Right. Um, where um, I chat GPT only, but it can kind of look and say, we can triage, we can preliminarily diagnose someone from suffering from depression or something like that to yeah. save time, um, save the time of the practitioners to say, okay, when I, once I had this triage, now I can more deep dive and treat them effectively. So I'm hoping that happens in education. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. And I remember that you mentioned also about the student journeys. So if you can elaborate a little bit more on that, how AI will help improve student, the student journeys. Yeah, sure. One yeah. misconception, which is persistent for some reason, is that the student journey is like this single line from enrollment to graduation. Yeah. And that might be true for some, but it's not true for most, right? A lot of students um, stop, start, they'll change majors, they might uh, leave, they might move to another university. Um, this becomes more prevalent if the student is um, at risk, first generation students, for example, adult students, transfer students. Um, so it's more of a highway. As anyone else, anyone else who's driven on a highway, you know, it's never going to be an easy route, right? Um, yeah. So one of the things that AI could do is help me navigate that. If we think about Waze, you know, the Maps app, we think about something like that that tells me, hey, there's a roadblock here. Um, there's an accident here. You might want to try this. You save time if you do this. Because we see too many students, for example, graduating with too many credits and therefore too much money. We see students who are feeling the stress um, of, uh, of being in school, worried about debt, which is another big one. If a student from the outset, when she began her journey, can basically say, okay, I want to get there. I want to be a veterinarian. Um, help me navigate that path. And if I change my mind, what are the pros and cons of doing that? That's the kind of vision I think AI could help us deliver on and change, uh, pretty much change how we support the student journey. Pretty interesting, right? It would be transformative, I In guess. Which it would be transformative. Yeah. yeah. But also, I can't miss asking you about the fears related to that as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. What there do you are think? fears. I mean, you know, we hear a lot you know, and all of us have some fears about perpetuating bias, right? Because yeah. ChatGPT is only going to be as good <laughs> as its inputs. Um, so if its inputs are already biased or are filled with misinformation, it's only going to spit that out, right? It's not going to right. do anything else. So um, whether it's reinforcing that and giving it almost a stamp of approval because a computer gave it to me, not a human. Um, right. So there's some fears there. There is the fear that eventually we might run out of data and text to give it. So we have to give it its own text and that might come into a lot of problems. And the third is um, uh, really about um, how, it's really about how we can, can have these ethical standards. How can we look at what's inside? Because a lot of the major technologists will tell you they don't know what's inside a yeah. language model, right? It's just there. We've trained it, humans were involved in training it, but once it's up and running, I don't really know what yeah. it's doing. Um, so it makes it really hard to evaluate one. Um, it makes it really hard to feel comfortable if someone says, hey, I've got a language model, here it is, it's really good. You have to just trust them <laughs> because you don't know what is, what's in it and they can't really always tell you what's in it. So those are the three big risks, I think. Absolutely. Do you think we are sort of close enough to managing these fears or somehow not I, allowing them to come? I think we're not close, actually. No. Um, right. I think because I, I think because of the creators of some of these models, including the creator of OpenAI, the found OpenAI, the founder, himself said, we have to stop this. Right? We have to kind of figure out um, a way to evaluate them to protect it from bias, protect them from misinformation, and put ethical safeguards around them. Um, but right now, on their own, he's like, we can't do it. So we need government to help, we need policy groups to help us, we need a, a, a more concerted effort across the board for us to kind of begin to say, we can trust this thing. 
Um, yeah. Cause right now, if the trust goes, it's gonna be very difficult for AI to kind of keep, keep moving and gaining support um, in universities and colleges. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Lastly, I want to ask sure. you, um, what do you think the future of AI for education uh, is basically like do you are you more optimistic pessimistic optimistic but I'm not a hundred percent optimistic I'd say I'm at 80 percent I think um, I think the current worries some of them will remain um, some of them will die down um, yeah. the ones that will remain to be about bias and information they'll remain and about understanding the model itself others will die down about losing my jobs and etc they will kind of die down a little bit um, I think I'm optimistic that we might have, you know, this foundation model, as I called it, or not, as I call it, as Stanford University called it, this idea that I have an AI kind of almost engine that's taking in different sources and analyzing them, interpreting them, and um, informing other tasks, um, like understanding students, understanding their pathways, et cetera. I think that's gonna be a paradigmatic shift. Um, instead of worrying about individual pieces of technology, I think this type of model is gonna be key. Um, and I think that's a short way away. I think we're close to having something like that available. Right. Um, so I'm optimistic about that, but within the context of the fears that I mentioned before. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would say let's remain optimistic. Let's remain optimistic. <laughs> Definitely. And thank you very much for your time and oh, being thank you. here thank you. in Murumut Global. I wish you a really good time here and enjoy your stay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.